Hello, everybody. It's, it, the time is nine o'clock, and uh, we're moving with uh, our first uh, plenary speaker, uh, Dr. Yelena Kovacevic. So I'll uh, take a few minutes to introduce uh, Yelena. Uh, Yelena is William R. Berkeley Professor and Dean of the Tandon School of Engineering at New York University. Uh, she comes from Serbia and she has an undergraduate degree from the University of Belgrade. Uh, she received her PhD degree from Columbia University, then joined Bell Labs, followed by Carnegie Mellon University, uh, where she was a uh, Hammers like university professor and head of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and also faculty of the Biomedical Engineering Department. Uh, Yelena is a world renowned expert on signal processing and data sciences. She is an authority on multi resolution techniques such as wavelets and frames. Her research work cuts across diverse domains such as. Uh, biology, medicine, and smart infrastructure. For her research, she has been recognized with the Signal Processing Society Technical Achievement Award, the Dowd Fellowship at Carnegie Mellon University, the Belgrade October Prize, and the EI Jury Award uh, from Columbia University. <clears throat> she has co authored a number of award winning papers and is co-author of the textbook uh, Wavelets in Subband Coding and Foundations uh, of Signal Processing. Uh, Yelena is a fellow of IEEE and was editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions on Image Processing. She has been keynote speaker for a number of meetings and has been involved in organizing numerous uh, conferences. Um, Yelena is the first female dean of en the engineering school um, at uh, New York University since uh, 2018, when she became a dean. Um, she has achieved amazing things, including raising the visibility of the College of Engineering, and has done also amazing things in diversifying the student body. And uh, I'm sure she will tell us more about this. Yelena? Thank you, Athena. This was amazing. Um, I first want to check, does everybody see my screen? I started sharing. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, um, now an official good morning, uh, afternoon, evening, everyone, wherever you are in our new world. I am very excited to be here and I wanted to thank uh, the organizing committee, especially Athena and Farok for inviting me. Um, this talk is part um, is based on, on in part on an opinion piece I wrote for the point of view column of the proceedings of the IEEE in uh, October 2017. Um, so uh, let me start by um, starting with a quote uh, of Malcolm Gladwell, who in his book Outliers, The Story of Success, said that who we are cannot be separated from where we are from. Thus, this long history of where I come from and what shaped my thinking is crucial, at least for me, to understand where I'm going. So it's a, it's a very personal story and I hope you will indulge me with this. Um, so what you see on the screen um, are essentially pancakes, we call them palachinke in, in Serbian. And um, my you know, dad would play these games with me and he would say, your mom made five palachinka and your brother ate two, how many are left for you? And so for some reason, this sort of sweet math got etched into my mind as one of my earliest memories. And it was my dad playing number games with me, um, card games, puzzles, word riddles, brain teasers, anything where you had to figure out things he loved. And then of course, so did I. I just want to show you the result of eating that many palachinka. This is me at, at age two. I can barely fit into the shoes. <laughs> so um, he, as, as I said, he played, you know, many, many other things. You know, he was just an intensely curious man. And I was just so excited to be treated. I felt always I was treated as a peer. Um, what you see here is he's wearing a Mathematica t-shirt 
at the time when I was a grad student, anytime I would publish a paper in which I used Mathematica, if you send them a copy of the paper, they would send you a t-shirt. So I had a bunch of these that we all used around the house. So I grew up in uh, ex-Yugoslavia, uh, a socialist country at the time where gender equality was guaranteed, or at least that's how it sounded to everybody. Women were supposed to be able to do everything men did. In my family, in particular, run by my fierce Montenegrin mother, um, uh, a mountainous region uh, now in Montenegro used to be former Yugoslavia, that was really fully on display. She had infinite confidence in me and believed I could do anything I wanted. And the only time I remember her being disappointed was when I sold myself short in some way. And my dad, um, to this day, the most brilliant man I've ever met, uh, was a true intellectual, was intensely curious and, and fearless. He went on to be the mayor of Belgrade and Yugoslav ambassador to the US for two years until he was recalled by Milosevic for not promoting his nationalist agenda. So instead of collecting a pension from the State Department, he resigned and at the age 59 became unemployed. And he transformed the last 20 years of his life by writing books. He wrote the first English Serbian and Serbian English dictionaries of idioms and became a linguistic authority in the third period of his life. And he also wrote books on diplomacy and negotiation and many others. And as busy as he was, he really left an indelible mark on my life. He treated me as an equal, even as a little girl. And, and that empowered me for the rest of my life. Why am I telling you all this? I was just incredibly lucky. I loved math and was encouraged to pursue it. And growing up, I don't remember a single instance of anyone doubting my intellectual abilities. Unlike many others, I had the full support of everyone around me. I was never told I could not do something, so I just went, went ahead and did it. But this also tells you that I was, you know, and I realized that I was also somewhat clueless. I looked at the world through the rosy lenses of my own experience and probably ignored jobs coming my way. Personally, that was a protection for me. So for example, when I saw the attendees' jaws drop when as a fresh PhD graduate, I delivered a tutorial at a major conference, I thought it was funny. I did notice though that I was one of only two women PhD students in the um, E department at Columbia in the late 80s. And I did hear, hear an occasional, you know, she got the job because she's a woman comment, and I just ignored it. So what really gives me the credibility to talk about this? You know, must I be in the know because I'm a woman? Uh, while my perceptions changed gradually over the years, I really think the turning point for me was becoming the EC department head at Carnegie Mellon University, because it was now my job to take care of the others. And so I spent numerous hours talking to students, faculty, staff, alums, parents. You know, I started noticing comments in meetings. I heard heart-wrenching stories of girls who didn't make it into engineering, but against great odds. I looked at numbers and was shocked to see that at the time we were only about 20, 21% women undergraduate students. And so in other words, I started educating myself. I attended the Leadership Academy for Women at Carnegie Mellon. I read articles and none of what I learned and none of what I'm going to tell you, of course, was new, but some of it was new to me. I mean, women were discouraged and rejected from STEM long before I started noticing it, despite isolated examples of celebrated brilliance. You can think of Marie Curie, um, you can think of the incredible African-American female mathematicians who were described in their figures, Hedy Lamar, an American actress who invented spread spectrum and many others. But even these extraordinary women faced incredible obstacles. Marie Curie was not initially included with French physicist Pierre Curie, her husband, and Henri Becquerel on the list for, for her first Nobel Prize. 
to fight for her, male advocates were needed. The Swedish mathematicians, uh, mathematician Magnus Gosta Mita Gleffler and Pierre Curie. In 1911, she was denied the seat in the French Academy of Sciences, losing the election by two votes only. Ironically, the same year, she won the sec second Nobel Prize, one of only four individuals today to win more than one Nobel accolade. Katherine Johnson, who worked on flight trajectories during the space races in the 1960s, NASA engineer Mary Jackson and supervisor Dorothy Vaughan, all had to fight both gender and race stereotypes just to be able to do something that they were extremely good at. What um, on, on this slide you actually see um, on the right, Marie Curie in a mobile X-ray vehicle during World War I. She came up with the, the idea and equipped 20 such field units that were affectionately known as Petite Curie, Little Curie Curies. And on the left, you see on, on the bottom, that's Katherine Johnson, a NASA mathematician who calculated trajectories for a number of missions. And I'm sure most of you have seen uh, uh, the movie Hidden Figures after the eponymous book. Uh, profiling other African-American female mathematicians of the time. And on, on top left, that's Kedi Lamar. So what is really surprising, I find, you know, is that this still happens. So evidence of gender bias in STEM fields really abounds. You know, from the prestige gap, so that prestige is weaker than field, but, but more important. Uh, it was measured by the National Research Council. The fact that women are still paid less than men. Um, at the time that I wrote the column, this was six, 65K for women to 79K for engineering graduates. Um, to the fact how female and male entrepreneurs are described and funded. Um, there was a study in Sweden on how uh, venture capitalists ju judge male and female entrepreneurs. Uh, and you can see here on the slide how what the, the adjectives are and what comments were made about the average male entrepreneur, like young and promising for the female that would be young, but inexperienced. For the men, it would be arrogant, but very impressive competence. For the woman, it would be lax network contacts and in need of help to develop her business concept. You can see sort of how the same attributes are described completely differently for, for men and, and for women. And we send such biased messages all the time, right? If I didn't tell you, I don't know if it shows here, these are the um, front, the covers of Girls Life and Boys Life from September, 2016. Really, do, do we really believe that girls only care about hair and makeup and boys only about planes and computers? I mean, don't mean to misunderstand me. I actually love clothes and makeups and romantic comedies and all this stuff, but I love math and science and languages and music and many other things. So why are we being pigeonholed, you know, both men and women into specific just drawers, if you want. And some of what we see and hear is unconscious. And while bias is natural and ubiquitous, educating ourselves about it really helps bring awareness and tools to combat it. And we need advocates. We need both male and female advocates. And so why should we care, really? I mean, beyond the obvious fact that we are excluding half the population, and I'm being mildly sarcastic here, I mean, research shows that diversity makes us smarter and diverse groups perform better. And so we scientists respond to research and that's what we need to use. So we have to take action. And, you know, I, I started doing a number of things, both at Carnegie Mellon and NYU. We have to get educated. We have to state inclusion as a priority and I, uh, we have to articulate why we do not only believe that it is the right thing to do, we believe it's the smart thing to do. I mean, it does help that both at Carnegie Mellon at NYU, especially in computer science and engineering, 
I did find a fertile ground for such efforts, but you know, it, the, the concentrated effort is needed. And so we have to create a vision and strategy that starts from crucial stages in middle school and earlier. I would like to play, um, this is actually a Ver Verizon commercial. Um, so I wanna make sure that I'm gonna click here Athena, would you just let me know if it's not playing? Otherwise, okay, I will just go through it, okay? Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes, we we'll see okay. it. And can you hear it? Who's my pretty girl? Yes. Okay. Sammy, sweetie, don't get your dress dirty. Sam, honey, you don't want to mess with that. Let's put him down. Samantha, this project has gotten out of control. Whoa, be careful with that. Why don't you hand that to your brother? Our words can have a huge impact. Isn't it time we told her she's pretty brilliant, too? Encourage her love of science and technology and inspire her to change the world. So I think this is a really telling little story, right? So seemingly well-intentioned comments from the key people in our lives, parents, teachers, peers, will really turn some girls away. And it's, so it's up to us to make our work cool and to support girls who want to do it. And, and we need to educate more scientists. Our society needs them. And so I want to give you just one slide about what was done at NYU. And while the numbers alone do not give the entire picture, they do help. Um, so we have uh, a four-step pipeline plan starting with our K-12 center through recruiting, supporting students once on campus and involving our alumni. We, and we have seen an 81% increase in women undergraduate enrollment since um, 2015. The class of 2023 is 46% women. And the last three incoming classes were 43%, 41%, and 37% respectively. And so at NYU Tandon, we view recruitment as but one aspect of a holistic approach. And we start with a four-step student pipeline building process to ensure that you know, the STEM world of today and tomorrow better reflects the real world. So the first step is encouraging girls to participate in STEM early. We have a large center for K through 12 STEM education that offers a variety of programs for middle um, middle schoolers and high schoolers, um, such as computer science for cybersecurity. It's a free three week program that introduces group 80% of whom are high school women to the in demand field and provides mentorship and inspiration from women who are already in STEM. Fully 50% of the participants in our 2019 programs, and we had 10 free programs, were women. And large percentages are also underrepresented minorities. Um, as step two, um, we look at how to recruit and enroll women students. Twice a year, we hold Tend on West, an event for prospective and newly admitted students to allow them to learn about the accomplishments of our women faculty members and students. And at Westfest, where W starts for women, accepted women gather in the summer to meet others in their cohort and connect via, with campus resources. And we hold regular Facebook Live events to address questions from prospective women students about opportunities here. Then step three is creating a welcoming and inclusive environment in which every student can thrive. Women students can actually choose to live in our Women and Tendon Explorations community. It's a dedicated floor in a residence hall that offers a strong support and networking system. Um, my first year um, when I arrived for the moving day of the 10 floors, the floors were that were mixed. Most of the students, you know, 
were sitting in their rooms looking at their phones. When I came to the women at tendon floor, there were like 50 of them cheering and jumping up and down. It was very exciting. We have a womb mentorship program that matches women sophomores and juniors with their older counterparts in uh, order to build a sense of community. Uh, we have student clubs, Teminis, uh, SWE, Society of Women Engineers, Women in Business and Entrepreneurship. We hold an annual Women in STEM Summit. We strongly encourage men attend on to engage in concrete behaviors, and we have male allies as an advocacy group. And then finally, the step four is that our alumni stay involved, and we have established an alumni advisory council whose members support the advancement of women students by serving as mentors, providing job shadowing and internship opportunities and speaking at events. And then, of course, we celebrate the successes and accomplishments of our women alumni, including um, Ursula Burns, who in 2009 became the first African-American woman to ever um, helm a Fortune 500 company. Um, but there is still much to be done, of course. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be having this meeting. Uh, once our students graduate, many go into the tech industry in Silicon Valley. And while a young field, it has not been very welcoming to women. Um, you have all read about this. And gender stereotypes still abound from how an engineer should look. Um, I look like an en engineer Twitter movement uh, was started by software engineer Isis Anchali, uh, formerly Wagner, in response to comments that followed the recruitment ad in which she was featured. Uh, the ad generated backlash stating that she was a model and not a real engineer. And after she posted the picture above, the hashtag went viral with women from all the, around, around the world, including myself, posting pictures of themselves with a sign, I look like an engineer. And so what stops us from being an effective engineer? Here is a hilarious video. I'm playing another one here. Yeah, I mean, I've tried to get into coding, but my cleavage is just so distracting. I can't code because my long eyelashes make it hard to see the screen. I mean, I get lost in them. Plus, it's hard to keep my eyes open with these auburn strands of mink constantly weighing them down. When I'm not menstruating, I'm ovulating, so there's no time to code at all. It's super hard to code when every month your insides are ripped from your body in slow motion. Every hour I have to get to the bathroom to change my tampon. Otherwise, you get toxic shock syndrome. That leads to getting your arms amputated. Obviously, that makes it even harder to code. And my boobs, like, really prevent me from coding. I don't even have boobs yet, and they're still good in the way. It's crazy. It's hard to cope, and you can't stop crying. Or when you're having mood swings. Like, here comes one now. Totally. Coding is just too rational when I'm this emotional. I thought this was a great video. So, so we really need to continue educating everyone from our tech partners to our political establishment. And because this is really not a woman's issue, it is a societal issue. And, you know, we know that because a small individual bias can lead to a large societal bias, it is really up to us to fix it. Because if we don't uh, start fixing it, it, it expands and enlarges. And so we, men and women together, as parents and educators, must be advocates. Um, if you have a moment, go to this website, Parable of the Polygons, which has this funny sort of um, metaphor on the shape of society that is shapist. So you have triangles and, and squares and you can change the parameters and see what happens when you have different percentages of populations and distribution. It's really very well done, so highly recommend it. Um, so this is not a long talk, so I'll end on a personal note as I started. Um, I have a 27 year old daughter, um, so you can see, of course, how personal this is for me. And when she was born, I was struck with the realization that she was really not a mini me, 
because from the very beginning, she showed her own character and independence, uh, mostly by saying no a lot. My husband and I have been true partners in everything, and we didn't really have a prescribed way of how we would raise her. We thought that unconditional love would be a good start, and we'd figure it out from there. I did, however, had some thoughts of what we should and should not do. For example, I thought giving her Barbies would send a wrong message, so we had the Barbie embargo for a while. She would then look for Barbies to play at her friends' houses, and, and I realized I was doing it all wrong and that my only achievement would be that all she wanted was Barbies. So the Barbie ban was lifted and we were promptly overrun by Barbies. And I still remember she's an only child uh, playing role playing with two Barbies in her room. And one Barbie asked the other what she did. And that one said she was a teacher. And the answer to the same question by her friend was, I'm a mathematician. And so I thought, okay, my, my job as a mother was done, you know, enough said. And so she has grown into a really a beautiful and, and kind human being. Um, she grew up with a natural aptitude for numbers and patterns, but instead of becoming uh, like us, she chose her own way into biology. Uh, she became a nurse and I'm very proud of her choice. She has combined science with helping people exactly the way she wanted. And um, in her first year after earning a master's degree in nursing, because she was on a pulmonary floor, she became a COVID nurse, so heads off. Um, so let me end by telling you what I really wish for. Um, I wish for all of you and all of our students to be able to follow our passions. I wish for you to be able um, to fail and then pick yourselves up. I wish really for it to be okay to be average in something without confirming a stereotype, because that's something that very often happens to women. I wish for all you young people to chart your own lives the way you want and on your own terms. I wish for all of us and you to treat each other with respect and be aware of obstacles each other faces. And I wish for us, the elders, to take this personally because all of you, our students and the younger colleagues, you're all our kids. And honestly, I wish not to have to give a talk like this again ever because that would mean the problem has been solved. But so let's get to work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yelena, for this amazing talk. We will open the floor for questions from the audience. Just uh, turn on your camera and uh, ask a question to Yelena or make a comment. Anybody would like to start? I feel like in a classroom, right? <laughs> Everybody's shy. <laughs> or maybe I can ask a question just to uh, get uh, the discussion going. So, uh, Yelena, you had an amazing path. You went through different places, always going higher and higher. I was wondering, did you always have a long-term career plan? And uh, where, how did you know when was the right time to move on and try something different? You know, that's, it's, it's a question I very often get from students. And I will tell you, no, I didn't have a career plan. I sort of had a vague idea so first of all, I, I think it was clear from my presentation that I wanted to do something with math. And I went to this math high school in Belgrade. Um, and after that, I went to electrical engineering, not because I knew anything about it. It's just because people told me that's where you could do math. And it was an elite school in Belgrade. And then I did find, you know, interestingly enough that I could do things that are connected to helping people, right? To connecting what I was doing to, something that has to do with society. And then after that, I, I had a vague idea that I would have liked uh, to have gone to academia, but I, went to Bell, I wanted to go quote to quote unquote company first, just to see what the sort of what type of work it was. But I ended up at Bell Labs, which was really not a company. At times it was more academic than academia. And instead of staying two, three years, I stayed there for 11 years. And then 
towards the end of the 90s, um, when communications field where I was mostly kind of working was, I, you know, there was a feeling that it was becoming saturated. You know, there was a big communications bubble. Um, not that, you know, there were no more problems to be solved. I somehow felt I wanted to do something new. And I started reading a lot about what was happening in biotechnology, especially in biology. At the time, um, the green fluorescent protein was discovered that allowed biologists to actually tag things within cells, even live cells, and started becoming, biology became much more quantitative than before. It was much more qualitative beforehand because they could measure, they could, you know, look at things and measure and count and so on. And I thought, who, you know, the, the tools that I have from signal processing are really perfect for this. I mean, there were computational scientists in medical imaging, but not that many in biological imaging. So I kind of threw myself into it. And then at some point I felt, okay, now is the time for me to go to academia. So it wasn't really planned. I think it was more that I was attuned enough um, to opportunities when they would come my way. I mean, the same way I actually went to biomedical engineering department at Carnegie Mellon and was there for 10 years. And then I was asked whether I would be willing to throw my hat in the ring for the head of ECE. And I said, no, look, you know, I was, you know, having a ball being, you know, a researcher and professor, you know, I didn't start from the beginning. So I was like excited and working with my students. And they asked me many times. And then I said, like, why am I saying no? You know, I could try it and you know, I could have a bigger impact. And I'm so happy I did. And, you know, I, I have to say that in all of this, I was actually guided by something that my dad once said. He said, just try. The worst thing that happens is it, you don't like it and it's not going to work out. And then you try something else. So I've been throwing myself sort of, if you want, into deep end of the pool, even with the you know, biological imaging, nobody knew me in that community, even though I was established in the signal processing community at, at the time. So these experiences, when I look back of being attuned to opportunities, also the deanship at NYU, but also um, being aware that the times when I'm most uncomfortable, right, when I don't feel you know, I know everything and, you know, I know everyone it are actually the best times for me. So I have to live with this discomfort for a while because it leads to incredible growth. And these are the times where I felt I progressed the most. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, that's this the is best. Good. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question, Athena? Please. I just saw you, Rabob. It's wonderful to see you. One of those First in everything, I quoted you in that article that, oh, you know. <laughs> that was an amazing and exciting uh, talk and very uh, <laughs> lifting the spirit up. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about um, the increase in women students in engineering, at least in North America. I don't know much about the rest. Um, I noticed, but I might be wrong because I don't have the statistics that there has been an increase, but it was more in some engineering, not others, like in, uh, in, in the electrical engineering and this area, it was more in the biomedical mm -hmm. field and, um, uh, and maybe more in civil engineering than in hardcore uh, circuit mm -hmm. and electrical engineering and less in mechanical engineering, more in chemical engineering. There were always yeah. more in chemical engineering. Am I right or wrong? You're absolutely right. And I can tell you actually as department head of ECE, I was looking into these numbers because ECE numbers were always lagging behind the other engineering disciplines. And there is actually research that shows that young women when choosing um, their vocation um, respond much more to being connected to some 
societal impact. Not everybody, right? But mm. on average. And that's why biology, you know, chemistry, environmental engineering are really so popular mm. with women. I actually <coughs> went on, on, on really a path of trying to do this for ECE. And I remember what, you know, one thing that I did for all our core areas in the department, we created these one pagers where, where the front page was something that was easily relatable. So let's say IoT. So you would put all the devices, you know, from wearable devices to other things that would connect to real world impact. And then the back page was more technical. And we were giving these to both parents who really wanted to know what their kids were going to do and to incoming students. And so we were trying to, instead of talking how you do things, we were talking about why you do things, about the sort of end goal. Because not many of these girls were exposed, depending in what kind of a high school they went, to, you know, forget about engineering, you know, computer science or anything that had to do with, you know, technical field. So I think the key is talking about the why instead of the how. And then you say, well, the how is necessary to get to this. And I think more, more and more this is happening today. But the numbers have changed also in those fields that, you know, typically lag, but you are right. There are some, especially I think environmental engineering is number one, you know, bio, bio anything is, you know, high up there, biomedical, biological, biomolecular, and so on. Very true. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Well, I have another question, if possible, <laughs> but yeah. I don't, don't want to. <laughs> Um, the, um, the question is about, um, the, um, at, at least it was also from my experience, my father was a fantastic man, but he didn't want me to do engineering at all. I had to kind of play a trick and go to engineering. Um, <laughs> but then at the end he forgave me. But um, it wasn't, it isn't just engineering, it was society. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember when I said I want to do engineering, many people said, oh, wow, what, are you crazy? You know, like something like that. And many of them took a lot of time to convince me that it is not the right thing to do. Of course, I'm older than you, <laughs> things have changed. But that always left me that really to encourage women to do engineering we have to target parents mm -hmm. and uh, society and uh, show that how important it is for women to do engineering. Uh, traditionally, in all universities, we target uh, grade 12, grade 11, uh, but it's a bit too late. It is late. We I have agree. to start that mm -hmm. at grade, at younger grades. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, the problem I have been um, finding uh, is that in the elementary schools, uh, the teachers are usually women and they are not from the STEM fields. They don't know about STEM. And um, I think these are the people we have to target, the parents and the teachers in elementary school um, most of them don't know anything about math. I don't know how they allow, allow them. Now, in my case, I was lucky because the school I went to in elementary school, the teacher didn't teach everything. We had one woman teaching math, one woman teaching history, one woman. But in North America, or at least in Canada, the teacher teaches everything. And they always don't know about math. And I, I'm just showing it in my grandchildren now. Like my grandson, he could be a brilliant mathematician, but he's encouraged to be an author. And he, that's where he is going. And, but he gets good gr grades in math. I tell him, but you know, what about math? Oh yeah, you know, like no enthusiasm because I'm sure it's because from the teachers. You know, I think that 
I mean, at least from what I've read, and some of it is observed, I think the bigger problem is the teenage years, middle school. I mean, among other things, again, I read some papers where they say that kids, if they decide on a vocation and a path, it usually happens during middle school. But that coincides also with teenage years when really kids, bo both boys and girls, become much more susceptible to the images we project or expect of them, right? So bodies changing, hormones raging, peer approval is, you know, essential. So, you know, if you're labeled as a nerd because, you know, you like math and science, especially if you're a girl, that's kind of a kiss of death. Mm -hmm. And amazingly enough, even today, I speak to some of, even some of my female PhD students, um, their, you know, issues of their parents, you know, what they're worrying about is when they're going to get married. I am, I'm not discounting it, right? Because, you know, I am, you know, my life is full because also I have a wonderful partner and so on. But, you know, it's not the only thing that makes us people and individuals. And I think personally, without my work component, I don't even consider this work and personal. They're so intertwined that if one is missing, you know, I would be, I would feel like half a person. Look, even when I worked at Bell Labs and I was pregnant with my daughter and a colleague of mine, a guy of my own age, young guy with two kids said, you'll see once she's born, you love her so much, you will not want to come back to work. And I was genuinely puzzled. I said, how did you come back to work? And he didn't have an answer to that. And I don't think that this is anything that's, it's, it's just cultural norms, right? That inform so many things to happen. And if you want to go against the cultural norm, this is why I was saying, I feel my responsibility because I was so lucky is to give something back to those who were not so lucky as me. Because again, I was encouraged. My mom and dad were super proud that I was a, brainy, mathy, geek, right? You know, it's just that that's what I love. But that's rare. That doesn't happen so often. And so breaking against this, against your own family, against your, your own environment is very hard. So I agree with you, you know, showing parents, you know, that they could be proud and what their girls could do and what kinds of lives they could lead. I mean, look also, to be honest, engineering and technology, is especially today is a way for many kids to make really good lives for themselves and their families. I mean, in my school, we have third of the students about our first generation students. So once they graduate with a degree in, you know, whatever in engineering degree or computer science, they're gonna go and get a great job and help themselves and their families. So it's, it's just such a multifaceted problem, but I agree working on everything, working on teachers, working on... So we actually have a program to educate teachers as well at Tandem and hoping that through the teachers then in the New York City school system <coughs> then kids get educated, you know, appropriately as well. Thank you very, very much. Sure. Great. Uh, any more uh, questions? I see, Haris, you have a, a, a question. You want to ask it directly? OK, uh, hello. A very, very inspiring talk. Thank you very much. Uh, just wanted to know, uh, being a, a faculty colleague and uh, administrators of academic institutions, what is your advice to make the workplace inclusive? Because many times we do paint a picture that things are not so great for women to be in the workplace, in academia. Um, what was your advice and experience? Well, I, I do think, you know, I've heard somewhere that says culture comes from the top, right? You can't impose it, but you can model it. Um, you can also be, um, you can also be an advocate. You can be the one who steps in and 
kind of um, says something if there is a comment made at a faculty meeting, especially as a as a senior faculty member. So, so getting educated because in the moment, sometimes it's very hard to know what to say and how to respond. Um, but having some of these things ahead of time, you know, through workshops and tips and so on really helps. But it's not only for women, it's for, you know, all people understanding that everybody comes with their own history and then something, I mean, I have been guilty of this as well, you know, asking a faculty member in my department because he looks, you know, Indian, where he was from, he was born in Ohio. And I felt terrible that I made this assumption, right? And, and you know, and I am sort of trying to be aware, but so I, I sort of think always that it comes out of not knowing rather than not caring. You always have, you know, a small percentage of people who are kind of beyond help. And in some sense, what they think in their heads, I don't care, we can police that, but how they behave, you can, you know, give feedback. And if people are sort of isolated in instances where the behavior is not such that promotes, you know, respectful and inclusive environment. I think the biggest, the biggest tool we have is us, senior faculty members. We have tenure. So there is really no excuse for people not acting and saying something. And the more this happens, the better it will become. Again, when I was a department head, I never, for, for faculty searches, I made sure I chaired them. And we all went through, I mean, you know, read a lot and so on. And then we did kind of ping ourselves on, you know, reading a, a, a reference letter where it was clear that the comment was made that was kind of gender based. And so we just made each other aware. We made it so that it was not, oh, you're making an, a mistake, you're a bad person. We just made it, let's help each other catch those instances so that we can be as inclusive you know, as possible. And then with numbers, numbers are not enough. Numbers are just a necessary condition, right? For becoming better. But then you have to make sure that everybody is supported once they are in whichever environment, let's say academic environment they are. And, you know, look, it's an ongoing process. Culture is by far the hardest thing to change, the hardest. Thank you. Monica, I see you have a question. Do you want to ask it directly? Yeah, thank you. Kelina, it was a very wonderful talk and inspiring one. So uh, the problem is there everywhere. So what can be the solution? I just, you have experience. So uh, yeah, I'm also a faculty at IIT Delhi. My story is also like you. My father is a great man and he supported me all through life. And his, uh, he's 82 years old and he still works. The passion he has, I still feel that ignites me at the time of uh, when I feel low, but Seeing others, the society, the Indian society especially, the helps that we have, they don't allow their daughters to study. Mm -hmm. uh, the way things are, we should start from a very early. Uh, the girls are not going to the school. Mm -hmm. The training that they get is difficult, that they don't want to study. So what is the solution that we can have? Look, I mean, it would be silly of me to pretend that I have the solution, especially for, you know, every, every, every country is different and comes with its own set of cultural expectations. And what you are talking about, I heard many, many times from, you know, Indian students I've had, um, you know, some of my PhD students as well. Look, we, we do, you know, we make or, or we, put as many people as possible in the positions where they can influence the society and the culture like us, 
right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's not a magic bullet, but, you know, it's one by one. It, th there are big things that you can do, like, you know, we do at the school and we think how to attract more women and, you know, go to, you know, we are based in Brooklyn, actually, our school. So we have a lot of schools where, you know, there are kids who grew up in, in very difficult situations. They wouldn't even dream of being able to go to NYU. And by doing this, you know, you, you can have bigger numbers apply and, you know, get them to our school and so on. But it's also one by one, you know, talking to, to the girls and boys, right? I think it's, it's equally important when they ask me, you know, this thing of being first, you know, many of us, uh, you know, are, are, are aware of this. What does it mean uh, for me to be the first woman dean of the school? And what do I wish for the young girls? I always think I wish for the young girls and boys. I want them all to see a woman in a position of authority and not think that that is weird, right? It has to be on both. And I think, you know, our younger generation is very different or, you know, things are changing, you know, kids and students are actually demanding more in terms of social justice. I mean, this past year has been a maelstrom of activity on all fronts of social justice, right? And it's not, uh, you know, limited to one segment of society. Is everybody coming together to say, hey, <clears throat> this doesn't work, we have to do better. And so the young men are as important as the young women. I see here one of the organizers who invited me here is, you know, a junior faculty in my school, Farok. And, you know, he's passionate about this and he's gonna help those girls and boys to have, you know, the, you know, the, the environment in which everybody feels equally empowered to speak um, and to say things. I mean, there are lots of things that one can, that one can read research that's out there. For example, you know, writing, who would think before that how you write your faculty hiring ad makes a difference? Well, it makes a difference because if you have a five requirements for the job, women will think that they need to satisfy all five just to apply, while men feel confident that they, they satisfy only two, they'll apply and what the hell, they'll try, right? So I, it's, these, these are easy generalizations, but there, are, there is research that shows that this is indeed true. Why is that? Who knows? I think much of this is really cultural. It's the way we are raised. And so don't speak unless you do something perfectly, right? Um, and how these messages are given, they get coded in our brains. It's very hard to rationalize them and put them at the forefront and say, hey, this is silly. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to follow this. So it's very hard for these young women to say, I'm going to go against my parents, against you know, my larger family against my culture to do this. And so all of us who are, you know, educators and in positions where we can do something, it's, it's on us to put as many possibilities of entry into these systems. Um, and then the, number, the numbers have been growing. So, I mean, we are better off than we were 10 years ago and 20 years ago and so on, but we're still not there. Yeah, very, very important point, like you and Monica both uh, talked about your fathers. I would also credit my career path to my father. Uh, so we really um, need the men to help in this effort. And uh, in this project, we have involved uh, men as well as women. And the men are playing a very important role. Um, Farouk has been uh, really amazing in, in helping us with this effort. No, this is great. Absolutely. Because otherwise it's going to be preaching to the, to the choir, right? And, and then nobody takes ho whoever that group is seriously, right? It has to be a common effort. Right. Any more comments from the attendees?
Well, let me ask one more question since there are uh, no questions from the audience. What are some obstacles that you thought they were there, but uh, actually they were not? It was just in, in your uh, imagination as you were going forward with your career. You mean personally or for women in, in let's say, technology? You as, you as a woman, like pursuing all these positions. You know, it's funny, I never had this as a goal. Um, the thing is, when you become a department head, then people start coming to you, offering you dean positions. And once you're a dean, now they're offering me provost and president positions. So it's not like, I don't consider this a ladder at all. I consider this different opportunities. And I honestly, you know, don't take me at, at my word uh, because, you know, I don't think that three years ago I knew I would be here nor five years ago I would have done, you know, what I did. So I have no clue what I'm going to do next. You know, I might just go back to faculty. I may, you know, start a company. I have, I don't have um, a path that I think is, you know, you go from this to that, to that, to that, right? Um, so what the obstacles are, I mean, obstacles that have always been, you know, in my head, like everybody else, we all have the somewhat of, of an imposter syndrome where we think like, oh, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough or, you know, there are people who are more deserving. And, um, and you know, I tried to deal with this by looking back at the things where I was successful and also the things where I was not successful and picked myself up and went ahead. Um, so I don't know that there, are, these are just normal conversations that we have in our brains all the time. I'm sure you all <laughs> identify with this. We're constantly, you know, in our head talking to ourselves. And I think I have also uh, tried to spend some time on working out on things that are in my brain so I understand where they come from and how they influence you know what I do or I, I don't do but again I think because early on in my life I had such a fortunate upbringing you know both my parents not only my father my, my mother was amazing she wanted she she was saying when I get married she wanted me to get married in jeans, jeans and sneakers. I wasn't exactly in jeans and sneakers, but I didn't have a long white dress, so I couldn't do it, right? And so, so it's just like very unconventional, progressive, smart people for whom the only thing that mattered for the two of them was education and intellectual pursuits. So they really didn't care about, you know, whether, you know, I made money or I married somebody, you know, with money or anything like that. Um, so I think lots of this early childhood sort of, it was like a protective sheet, um, against me, uh, against sort of between me and the world, but also because they gave me this infinite self-confidence that I can do things that doesn't mean that I won't fail while doing it, but you know, you're going to fail. They're going to figure out why you failed. We are engineers after all. And then you debug it and you know you go to the next thing so you know i didn't get every job i ever applied for it's unrealistic to to assume that you would but so what i mean it's painful at the time okay you lick your wounds and you know you keep on going thank you thank you very much well, thank you. This was a, a, a real, real pleasure. And I hope that there were some students here and feel free to ping me.